All right, I have six o'clock first. Um, order is to do the post flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> first order of um, we're going to do budget presentation first. All right, so first order is the budget presentation to update us from MS 8054 Superintendent Schools. John Moody. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So, thank you for having me. Um, just wanted to walk you through a few things. I know um, some of you have heard this before, some of you haven't. Uh, I did page number the pages this time, which I hadn't last time, so <laughs> I think it's a little bit better. The second page is just our mission and vision. It's something we remind ourselves of as we work through the budget. It's primarily staff-based, but our staff and administrators focus on that. Page three is the state funding overview a little bit. Um, the right side of the top, that looks at how schools are funded from the state. Basically, town valuations, so not your local valuation that's done in-house, but what the town says your, your communities, I mean, what the state says your town is worth. Poverty level and student count are the big driving factors. Our valuations relative to the state average went up this year. So relative to the rest of the state, they think we're a little bit wealthier than we were. We still receive more aid than most. So we're about 62 cents on the dollar, 61.58 on the dollar. So um, we receive a healthy state subsidy. <laughs> Poverty level's actually gone down the last four years in a row, and we've seen it statewide. And I think it has more to do with the federal poverty limits and the way they record that, not real poverty. I think need is, if anything, bigger than it was pre-pandemic, but poverty rate for where we get money is down. And then student count. We've had uh, two years in a row of increased student count, but it's not kept up with the decrease to poverty and, and uh, change in valuation. Over to the left just shows you FY24 and FY25 funding. We are up on the yellow bar about 0.47% from the state, about 93,000. We were hoping to be close to inflation, three or three and a half percent, which would have been around 600,000, which really would have made, <clears throat> excuse me, made the local increase far less than it's gonna be as we move through it. The other piece in the bottom left is the new school. I think with some of the towns and their reevaluations, it impacted community members differently. And there was a feeling that the new school had an impact, but there's been none. There's no cost to the new school in this current budget. There's no cost in next year's budget. And that's really for two reasons. Most of the school, about 95% almost, it's 94 point something, is state funded. The remaining difference, which is about 4.4 million, 3 million of that we've fundraised locally, and we've picked up about 1.9 million through a CDS grant from Collins, King, and Goldman. So we received that about two months ago. So there's no impact, and there should be no impact in this year or next year. Um, and uh, we're actually going to be retiring the Norwich Rock School in 2028. And so that's about a 20-year process. So we built it in 07, 08, and we're going to retire in 20. So just the you know, stream is going to be in when? The death. We'll, oh, be, we'll be retired. I was like, the school uh, uh, <laughs> school's great. We just did a walkthrough the other day. It was awesome, right? <laughs> we were in, in classrooms. <laughs> um, so that gives you an idea of, of state funding. The next page, I created the next page to look at the way valuation impacts towns, and Norwich Rock was hit pretty hard. The shifting, this is last year's budget. So what I did is I took last year's budget and the numbers over to the left, excuse me, over to the right, are the changes that occurred if nothing changed. So if we just took last year's budget and put it this year, Norwich Rock's up 32000 Scowhegan's down 117 because of the shifting valuation. And that happens at the state. There's nothing I can do. So what I can do, and what the board can do, is we can pour more money in the top, whether that means we're putting in more grant money or we're putting in more money from fund balance, which will help drive down the local, or we can cut. And we've done both in this budget that I'll talk about a little bit. <laughs> but any questions on valuation? Because that really does have the biggest impact. On, uh, and we're 100% valuation, meaning it's not student count, it's 100% valuation district. Is the school district ever explored the possibility of mixing that or just, just it's the way of starting both? 
It's um, we haven't, and the process is one by which I think you're going to end just by numbers. I think you're going to end up with a stalemate every time, based on winners and losers. But we could. It takes a vote of the constituents or the school board to do it, and I think some smaller towns may ask for that. Um, currently. We have a, a bigger split this year than we've had in the past for cost per, you know, where those costs lie. So it wouldn't be advantageous to Norwich Walk. It would not. It'd be very disadvantageous to Norwich Walk. Um, if I shift to the uh, next page, the FY25 budget notes, this explains the budget. And this is a piece that I think is going to be confusing. So I'm on, I'm on page five. And uh, top is the yellow bar. So the overall budget's up to forty-eight million eight eighty-six. That is a sixteen point eight four percent increase, which is a very large increase. So we're going to have to do a really good job explaining. And I thought the newspaper article did a good job in the budget doing that for us, which was nice. But a big job explaining where does that increase come from? And so the overall budget increase is seven million, which you see just below. Then the new school, of the new school, you know, what portion of that is the new school, which we know is 100% not local? That's 4,258,290. So that gives you a 2,7787. And then of that, 403,505 is the tech center. And that is 100% state funded because we, there's a, it's not always, there are tech centers in the state that are beyond that and they pay local, but we've always kept it below so that it's 100% state funded. So that gives our increase down to 2.383 million, which is about 5.7%. So our real local increase when we back out those things that we had no control of was about, I mean, excuse me, not local. Our actual budget increase is 5.698. Looking at that valuation shift on the page before though, and what you see below, that was too big of a local impact. <clears throat> so we worked with the board to try to view ways to decrease that. And over to the left, I talk about that a little bit. One of the things we've done is we've, we've utilized main care revenue. So we're starting to bill for main care, which means my social workers are working with the clinicians that are doing the work with kids to actually bill main care and get a reimbursement like a medical model would. School people don't like that because it takes people who work with kids and a big portion of their time has to not be working with kids. But we've done a, a nice job kind of training around that. Our ed techs have trained to be BHPs. We help work with that through negotiations. So about we expect about $200,000 in this upcoming budget, potentially more longer term because we're just expanding right now. We also looked at adding just over $1.2 million in fund balance. And that's the biggest way we drove down the local increase. So it's significantly below the 5.698. That increase would have been far higher. Uh, you know, and it would have been different for every town, but the overall increase would have been closer to 9% had we not used that fund balance. Our plan right along as we went through the pandemic, assuming that as we all came off the federal and state spending, that we're going to have that elastic band come back and we'd have less money, was to kind of graduate like a CD ladder down. So we're going to start with 1.2 million. I expect next year is going to be a hard budget too. And we might be seven or 800,000. The following year, we might be three, four or 500,000 and then get back to zero. We couldn't do the 1.2 million every year. We'd run out of money. So we got to graduate that down. Um, but that's our intent is over the next three years to do that and try to keep the local impact below 4%, below 3% really is our goal. But it just wasn't something we felt we could do this year. Um, any questions on those valuations at the bottom? Okay. The next page is kind of good news and what we did. So it's a, it's a listing of things. And so I, I just wanted to highlight a few of the good news things that we're doing, and they're also budget related. An example is universal pre-K, we're adding pre-K busing, which we've never done. The more pre-K kids you get in when they're younger and you address their needs, they have less costs later on. So it is, it's great for kids, but it's also great for taxpayers in the district to get them in early. Pre-K is funded by the state. So when we get those kids in, if there's increased kids, there is a revenue there. Um, and when I say universal pre-K, because any child who's four by the date of enrollment, so it's just like kindergarten, October 15th, then they count as a regular student and we get that subsidy and we partner with KB Cap and they get Head Start dollars. So we have a, a program together where they use braided funding to do that. When we looked at what that would cost if it were just us, it's about 40% more. 
And so we've had a great partnership with KBCAP. They also reach out to the community and they help families. And so we're super uh, happy for that. We've aligned our curriculum pre-K-12. We're focused on mathematics this year, and then we'll be looking back at math, science, English, and social studies, uh, all four K-12, and as well as the other content areas. Big CTE expansion. Um, I've followed up on that question, Richard, but uh, we've had a major CDL expansion. So we now have two classes with two instructors, three trucks, if you go over to the high school. One of them was donated. Another, most of it was donated. Um, so we've had a lot of support. Uh, firefighting, actually, the town of Norwich Walk, Scowhegan, and uh, Fairfield have partnered to stand up a firefighting program for us. That'll be firefighting and EMT. That'll be coming back next year. We spent two years trying to hire an EMT to teach that class, and we couldn't. You know, it's just it's, it's lower pay at the school district than you might get in that field, and so we're super excited to have that. Reddington also is part of that uh, to support the EMT side. Um, computer science and coding, we've hired an expert in computer science who's now going to be doing that job. We've moved math and science over to the tech center so the kids aren't missing out of their high school schedules if it's hard for them, whether they're coming from Madison or MCI, wherever. Our tech center enrollments increase substantially, and that helps us because every kiddo who comes from our district and goes to the tech center, we get money in both places for the tech center and for the school district. A lot of flexibility for high school courses. We have the Aspire after school program. I think my balls are here. There's a lot of swag that we'd never buy if we were school people, but it's about a million dollar grant over five years to try to raise aspirations. So if you've seen the little stuffies that the kids are getting or have gotten, I don't know if you've seen those. Um, they're going out. I have one in the car. I meant to bring it in, but those are going to be going out to all the kids. So it's stuffies up through grade two ish, then swag bags up for a while, and then t shirts after that. And it's really all about getting them to think early about careers, opportunities, getting kids to understand that you don't have to go to college, but you can. Just because some you don't know people that have, we want to make sure you understand that. Somerset County has the lowest post secondary degree attainment, college or any than any other county in the state. We're like the fifth or 12th, I forget. We're in the top 15 in the country of lowest post-secondary degree attainment. And so we really want to focus on aspirations for our kids. What I like about CDE is a lot of those jobs are here so the kids can stay. Um, then the fiscal responsibility piece. Um, Mark's doing the numbers for me, so I'll have them at the district budget meeting. I believe we're close to $4 million in grants that we picked up to try to decrease local. Um, we've added three social workers district-wide and other services that are all grant-funded. Um, we have done some significant cuts, so that means right-sizing. You heard me say last year we cut multiple positions from the middle school. Prior to that, we cut a lot of elementary positions. We've already cut three high school positions this year. We've also taken some positions, um, like high school business department and the high school wood shop, and we've moved them over to the tech center because mm -hmm. it's better funding formula for us. It's not a cut but it is an effective cut in the local budget. Um, we did reduce some positions we'd love to keep. The nursing position was not in the budget anymore. We have two ed tech positions that aren't in the budget. We have an elementary position in Canaan that's not in the budget. All told, there were 12 local positions, uh, ranging from a two-hour custodial all the way to the teaching positions I just mentioned that were reductions. We also laddered down, like I said, of the CD laddering off the COVID money. So we've kind of done that the last couple of years. So there's 13 COVID positions that aren't in this budget as well. The overall budget is the next page. So if you had any questions on where we're spending our money, that's the overall budget. Mm -hmm. If you look at Warren Article 10, that increase is the increase in, you know, that we've seen in debt service. The reason that number is actually a little bit lower then the increase shown on the first page is we were able to retire a little bit of debt as well. And then you see CTE, which is the third Warren article, is up 18.19%. The other areas are pretty fixed based on um, our impact. If you look at the first, the second page, it talks about how we're about 80%. Once you take out debt service, we're about 80% people. So if you're going to cut, you really have to cut there. Um, we're pretty frugal on supplies. I think we've used the federal money to really buoy that up. And so there's not a lot to cut there, although we didn't add things this year. Um, special ed went up as much as it did, partly because we're moving things under special ed that qualify for special ed because it's a little bit higher reimbursement. So your own Melanie Keister joined us and she's helped to do some of that work. 
Um, and so that's why special ed has had as big of an increase as they did. Other instruction is athletics, basically. That increase is just fixed costs. Um, paint alone, we went up $7,000 to line fields. Uh, so there's some things there that, that are relatively unexpected that, that impacted the market. And then the last, the last page, <clears throat> last two pages, the next page shows you our kind of the budgets that I've been involved in, and that's why I include those for you. Um, long term, our local increase is 2.142%. And our overall increase is five point, uh, excuse me, our overall increase is 3.42% uh, over time. I put the bars over to the right so that you see what it is without the building project and with it, but you'll notice that the local percentage doesn't change. It's the same on the left as it is on the right because the, because the schools had no impact on the local budget, nor does CTE. So we've done well long term but we're going to have to pay close attention to it. If next year is a tough year, like I think it will be, we're not going to be able to drive it down as much as we have this year. And so that'll be something we'll come to you to talk about. But I think it's a, it's a priority for the board to balance high quality education and what's best for kids and fiscal impact, knowing the, the potential of someone on a fixed income in town who can't see their taxes go up a large number. And I know how limited you are as a select board, just like all the select boards, trying to impact that locally. You don't control the school, you don't control the county, and you have relatively small fixed costs. The last page just shows you, because I'm always asked this when I go out in various places, how do we compare to other districts around the state? The only way to do that really is to just take a per child average. Um, and the most recent state numbers on the website are 22, 23. And so here's our per child spending. We're at about 18,656. The state average is 23,960. So we're about 5,300 less than that. Um, it also shows that we spend far more on our schools. And so that's something I'm proud of. So if you look at where the dollars actually go, we spend 86%, 87% of our dollars on the schools and about 13.31 at the district level. The average is 30% at the district level. So it's just a where we spend our dollars, I think, is is money well spent. Um, that that does include the COVID money. So these metrics include the, the kind of orange bar, the federal grants. That's COVID money. And so you'll see ours change with the COVID money. And when that goes away, September 30th of this year, that's our last ability to use any of that COVID funds. And so when those go away, we'll, you know, you'll just see two years from now, you'll just see local. Is this per pupil spending like an 18,000? Is that like for their K through 12 or is that like per year? That is K, it's just K through 12 taking all our kids and straight average. Divide. Okay, so that's not like every single year each kid costs no. It's like, okay, right. No, it changes year to year. I mean, it's pretty much going up because it costs. No, no, no. Every, every year it's just the tuition price. If for each child? For each child. Yeah, okay. it's not, it's our total spending. Like this so year's it, budget. If you okay. Yeah, it's not local. So it takes the 60% state funding, the 40% roughly local funding, plus all the federal grants, and that's the cost. Okay. Yeah. And so you'll see there, the federal grant side is about 3.7, 3.635 million. I'm right at the state where I need to get classes. <laughs> it's new, it never happens. <laughs> it's like the- I assume it's bad lighting. <laughs> Yeah, Any Any Thank questions? you. Yeah. Yeah, so I have some questions. Okay. Yeah, I'll start off with a good thing. Uh, you touched on it, but the CDL program yes. has uh, put one of our employees, local employees, through that program in a very short amount of time. And it's zero local cost to us. Um, and as somebody that we've retained at public works and doubles at fire department. So that's a huge value. The one I talked to you earlier about is the very same some of the same situation. So that's okay. local, actually young in connections to our community long time um, that we're looking to get into that program to be able to retain because those programs are costing five, six thousand yeah. dollars. And they're having to travel. I think the nearest one is um refill maybe down to Rana Club. Yeah, I heard, um, I heard it was even further at the scheduling meeting. So yeah, so it's tough. And so we appreciate that. I appreciate from administration the response of that. I know I've done some things with you lately. Yeah. Um especially coming from RAC, which I'm gonna digress to shortly, but okay. um that's just been great. Um and by and large the staff here at the local school has been good. Um 
to that end, I want to just touch on a few concerns that I hear in the community. Um, and one of them is uh, related, I think, to what we do a lot here well, and that's our parent teacher group, yep. which I think is unique in your district in terms of what they do. But I think they're incredibly active. Yes. yes. And I love it. It's good for the kids, and they involve us, and we use our charitable veins to be able to support the kids as well. But is it true that we're the only school here in Norwich that does not allow for spirit days due to perceived inequities amongst the students? Are we the only school that doesn't do Is Green the only school in Stack 54 that does not allow spirit days? I wasn't aware. I'm, I don't know about spirit days, so I'll have to yeah. follow up. Because for the field day, which is the town sports, yeah. uh, in June, they want to have a drone sent up to be able to take a picture of the kids yeah. of MSES yeah. in the school colors. Yeah. So the notion was, could we ask the kids to wear blue or purple shirts? And the answer to that was no, because of perceived inequities amongst the students and that the teachers themselves had put that through. And if that's the case, then I think from a community perspective, uh, I have concerns because there are local avenues like the DTG, like the town's resources. What would be the inequities with wearing a colored shirt? That it makes a kid feel left out if they don't have a blue or gold shirt. Oh, I gotcha. But anyway, I've heard that from a number of places. And okay. that's the case, you know, we would like to be able to support where we can yeah. so the kids can enjoy fun things. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm going to skip over that one. No, I'm not going to. Um, food service. Yep. You know, that's a thing we hear a lot with the kids. Uh, I've heard it from staff with their school more when they're voting, and I myself can smell it. Um, I just, I read the menu in the Sunday paper, and I just feel like there's a lot of opportunity to get kids to take those healthy meals that are prepared. Yes. They're just not freezing the plate. And, and I think that's what a lot of folks see in that. So they're seeing food that's freezing the plate. Or yeah. breakfast weeks every three weeks and things like that. Yeah. I mean, we know that our children are not to blanket in, in the negative, but a lot of children that are in our schools, that's the only good meal of the day that they get. Yeah, sure. And so when we're doing things like that, the processed meals by and large, and I know that we can check all the boxes at the federal government, right, right. Right. Too, but I don't think that that's in the spirit of what we're trying to do for the kids. One of our goals locally is to increase locally cooked food. Mm -hmm. So food that's prepared in our kitchens. That, right. That I think that would be amazing and overcome a lot of different things. But you're not seeing that. You've heard complaints about that. A lot of it. Okay. Even from your own staff. Yep. And then I'll skip over that one and I'll skip over them. Uh, the last one that I had, we talked about distribution amongst the communities and expenses and whatnot. And then we talked about the price of paint. Yeah. Um, but the school department, the, the school district has gone and taken local dollars, I'm assuming by and large, to improve the ball field at the middle school to yeah. allow for the high school baseball team to play there. Yep. We're paying probably from local dollars to uh, transport the baseball team for games, the home games are now away and all the way games are away. Yep. And we're transporting the tennis team to at least Smithfield for home and then away away. Yes, and uh, does the can, does the school district intend to seek reimbursement for all of those costs on behalf of the other member communities from the tennis value for bridge of contract? Or is the school going to be content standing by and watching them earn the interest on the money which they have in the bank and expect towns like large block to absorb this added expense? So two things, there is no breach of contract. So there was no contract that they have to do this. There was a, a purchase and sale agreement and the sale agreement was that they would transfer a baseball field. And, and I would have expected it to be done this spring. And I've been, people have heard me talk about that. It was in the paper. And we got the state to give them 1.98 million. So there was no district money going to them. Is there a cost to us for sure? Um, there's some costs that don't exist. Like we would line the field and do the work at Memorial and we paid for those things. So that doesn't exist that did. Um, but I would say the cost is bigger as far as the busing kids and dealing with no homes and, and all of that. It's not huge. Um, the, the expenses that we spent at the middle school, I would say a little over half of those we would have spent anyways, and it needed to be done on redoing the field, you know, the fence and the infield, the batting cage that we purchased and the batting cage is going to be there. That wasn't something that we would have done other ways, but I think it's beneficial. So no, but acknowledging your point, Richard, I think if it gets to a point where that cost is going to be a significant impact that would be spread across the board, 
then we would want to do that. So, and I appreciate that, but even at this point in time, I think that the discussion should be had. I mean, there's been a lack of leadership there, and there's going to be transitions, but I don't think, you know, they're just as conservative of the community as we are. Yep. They've got their practice the same as we do. We balance our budget. We didn't hand out 30, 40% increases to our taxpayers last year. Uh, they did. So the money's a lot out there. They're throwing millions of dollars at their rubber. So if they've got it, why are they trying to pay even $20,000 a year to transfer that expense to communities like Marjois, but then also Mercer or Canaan? And, and from the local perspective, I think it would be appropriate to have that conversation with them because interest rates are great. You've got money in the bag, which they do now. Yeah. You know? We've, like most things, it's a it's more nuanced than that, but we've had the conversation that if there's a long-term impact that we would potentially do that. I As of the board meeting where we had a lot of baseball parents come to talk to us, so it was roughly a month ago, I've now been involved in Scout Eagan's work with the baseball field. So I was there when they met with the state to talk about the conversion. I was there when they met to talk about um, their timeline. They, I assisted with that. I was at the last select board meeting to talk about the bidding, which it looks like they will have ideally, not the next meeting, but the meeting after, they're gonna be hopefully going up, agreeing to go up to bid and move forward with the field. Um, so because I'm involved in that, I'm feeling much better about it. The flip side of that coin though, and some individuals mentioned it in meetings, but not in the select board meeting, is the town of Scout Egan was letting us use their field, their property, we're never charging us a penny. We didn't, you know, for 50 years. And, and so you could go down that route both ways and have an argument. I want to be a good steward of the taxpayers' money of all communities and work with all communities. I don't believe there's a big impact to the town of Norwich Walk from anything we've done so far. But if it were to change, if we were going to be doing this situation year over year because they're not able to come through, that would be a different conversation. And I'd work with the new town manager on that. So if they're not looking to construction next year, like the conversation might be different. Exactly. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I do have a random question. If we're looking at yeah. just for Norwalk specific, um, I brought it up before with the principal at Mill Stream. The policy of pick up and drop off with yeah. kids at the school changed like during COVID, which was, I understand, yeah. parents always used to go into the cafeteria, sign their kids out, and they would wait there for them and they'd come and do it. That changed. And since then, even without COVID, whether it's two below zero, pouring, sleeting rain, parents have to just stand out there for anywhere between 10 to 25 minutes just waiting for their kids to get sent out. Is that like, I I was told there that it was because kids deserve their privacy in case they pull a nutty in the hallway so no one watches them. <laughs> and That's, yeah. it's really a lot like, as a parent, I'm just glad it wasn't my kid. I don't care, but like that was never the case before. And I just know that sometimes that's, you know, the parking there is atrocious. People park in fire lanes up on the back. I mean, yeah. it's crazy. But then when you get there and it's like windy, sleety, and you're just standing out there soaking rain and wet and like, you're just like, okay, has it, why can't we go in? <laughs> has it improved? We addressed no. this at the start of the year. I had a conversation and I've it's been exactly told it's policy. improved from where the start till now, as far as staggering times. Uh, so it's, it's uncommon for a school to have the parents come in and get the kids for that dismissal. It is common for them to wait in their car or have students get dismissed to the car at that age. That's the more common approach, the way we well, did we it. We had to but... get out and like sign them on a piece of paper that's like yeah. covered in plastics, it's raining, and then you just stand there and wait for them. And we never did that. I mean, years and years and years, we just yeah. went in, signed them out on that sheet. And then you... okay. I think the best way to handle that is to take that active PTG group and have a meeting after school and talk about it. Because I can't speak to that, but I know- So I it's not the district the policy, it's the school making that choice. The school's choosing the logistics of the way they're doing it, but in all, most all the schools, the parents don't go in to pick up the kids. They pick them up outside, yeah. But so it's different at every school, so I'd have to, that's not something I'm super knowledgeable about at okay. every school about. I know I'm knowledgeable about Bloomfield because I was there this week, mm -hmm. and so I see that, and it's not unlike what you described. Yeah, okay. Um, but I, but we could probably do it better. You know? Yeah, no, there's no- What you described about standing out in the rain, I yeah. would think we could have a better plan than that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Please, snow or please don't put a pop up tents all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. It was right there. It was the table. It was super easy. Like, it right. never was an issue. Like, yeah, it was super yeah. uh, Maybe there's a way for us to do things differently. So the cafeteria is the pickup. I don't know. We did add, add after school programming that we've never had with the Alphon. And so they've taken up some space. I don't know if that has a piece of it. I don't know. Just Not to bring one thing. Sorry. But you're here on the ones here. 
Uh, I will come anytime you call. You know? No, that's okay. I used to reach out. Uh, with regards to pickup, that brought up the school resource officer. Yes. And that has been a very positive addition. I know it he's been murdered from taxpayers, but uh, it's been a nice addition for us to have and I think the are feeling that good perception. So very good uh, addition there. But the school pickup. Yep. I don't know how far this gets, but we have had a number of motor vehicle human issues, people yep. hitting people in the crosswalks within inches of children um, more than twice, close to three mm -hmm. times. We had a woman come through a month ago, maybe, mm -hmm. um, and just no stopped. She just went like crazy. And so I think that when she speaks about the pickup routine, people yeah. are coming in there and you have to realize that the parents are more diverse than the kids are, uh, that because of the way that it is and the chaos that's created there, I think you're causing behavioral problems with adults. Yeah. And it's putting other people in danger. That's something I know we've doubled the duty coverage. Yeah. So well, you can just like double park in. Like they're so lazy, they won't park down the thing. They'll literally park behind people. So you're sitting there, you're waiting, you're like, and I can't even go anywhere because someone just parked a pickup truck and got out to like what you know. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then my first like the last thing that promise is the after school program. Yeah. And that is I understand that it's meeting a need to folks within our community. But I don't feel necessarily from what I've seen, my yep. involvement with the town and, and Breck, that it's maybe the most efficient use of the space that we have. Okay. When you are taking up the entire gymnasium and the cafeteria and the stage area. And then I'm it been discouraged. I don't pay taxes here, but it's simply enough to send tax bills to see the level of care that is taken care of in their primary space. It's filthy. It's disorganized. In the space on the stage? Yeah. And it's discouraging to see that that's what is happening. You know, with the truck on the outside of things, that's taxpayer property, and we yeah. need to maintain it. And that's not a perception that I get from that. And when they're in the gym or anywhere else, they just, I don't get that feeling. That okay. Is I've, that seen, about it. I've seen improvements on that. I was in there just this week. We did a board walkthrough, and it was... But it's, uh, I just when when my rec program gets bounced around, yep. our elections get bounced around, and we feel like we're in convenience, what they're telling us we're in convenience. As much of the program can have a positive impact in the community, it's a negative yeah. impact in the community. Okay, yeah. it's been a huge positive for parents, like during vacation week when they can't uh, have any. Right, care. I get that. Cost the child care is yep. crazy, but it can't come for the gain of a very small few with the expense yeah. of everybody else. I think we should, yeah. There has been with I know the small specifically when kids were for the rec program were practicing in the gym. I know it happened to my kids several times. Others they get locked out, they go and they come out to get something and whoever's running it would take the thing out and tell them they can't get back in and then they're calling me on the phone thankfully they had it and like they won't let me back in and it's like why, why would you obviously the kid she's on basketball shorts let her yeah, back so in. that's just communication and, management that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, those conversations have been had. Yeah, that, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so what I would say is steer people to the office, talk to the principal. If they don't get recourse, call me. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Sure. Time. Okay, I will look for a motion on the review and approval of the minutes from April seventeenth. Ooh. Got a second? All right. Um, so all those in favor? Discussion on the minutes from April 17th? None. All those in favor? That's everyone. All right. We'll move on to members' reports. All right. I'm all good. Awesome. I'm good. I don't have anything either. Okay. I tried to go short. Uh, the Wade Street property where the building burned, that work is now complete. The 90 day notice uh, for redemption on the foreclosure has been sent. Um, last week, the week before, legislature down to Augusta put more regulations into place for us to have to jump through in terms of disposal of that property. Um, we're still on track. What they've done is they've taken away some administrative fees and they are requiring that we use a realtor. There's no if ands about it. The person can't wait, they have to use a realtor. So uh, we'll get onto that later in the meeting, but um, that was a little discouraging just because of the energy and time that it takes to, to move those along. But by the end of July, we should be ready to move to put those to market if they have not been redeemed. 
Uh, we replaced two double windows here in the front office. As a result of that, we pulled the bulletin board off the front. That's all rotten. It's an eyesore right now. The building's getting washed tomorrow, and then a new bulletin board should be in next week. But um, it was kind of an unexpected expense for the building, but um, one of the windows has been popped for a little while, so it was a single pane, and it just needed to get done. So uh, we did that this last week. Planning board meetings canceled for this month. In June, they're going to start an ordinance review. The chair has asked for that. They have not done that probably since I've been here. Uh, so that should be good, at least uh, process there. Tip advisory is scheduled for the day after Memorial Day. We'll see if that one holds. A lot of notices going out uh, for sewer. Um, I've got 30 day notices. Mm -hmm. Next week, I've got automatic foreclosure notices. A little later in the month, uh, we'll send the liens. And then I've also got tax courtesy notices, which are the free. We don't charge for them. Um, you didn't pay taxes last year. And if you don't pay within the next 30 days, you're going to get $11.65 charge on your account. And that just sends people furious. So um, we've been doing those and hopefully that'll be productive. But library trustees, they uh, moved their meeting time up to three o'clock. And they also have a, a children's author program this Saturday at 1030 uh, at the Mercer Road Library. The new playground chips, those are getting covered by FEMA. Those will arrive next week. Uh, the new adaptive playground equipment, I received shipping notice on that. That came through with the grant with New Balance. So ideally, we're going to install that with in-house staff and then plan something in terms of ribbon cutting once that's complete to coordinate something with New Balance as a condition of the grant. Uh, internet and surveillance at Ashley Link Park are up and running now in the trail maintenance building. The building itself is complete. There's some residual groundwork around it that's got to be done, but things are looking really good down there. The FEMA site visit was the Friday after our last meeting. We went to look at uh, an area that had washed on the shoulder of the road, a culvert, wood chips at the playground, and then the building that flooded. And that was, you know, five hours um, to go and visit those sites. It was absolute federal bureaucracy at its best, <laughs> but we came out where we needed to be. So um, anyway, uh, that's moving forward. But now instead of one project category, I've got, I think, five that I'm having to bucket all my expenses into is what it is. In the Usula Park building, that swap was done at the last meeting. The insurance claim is going to cover uh, most of the contents, and if not all of the contents, what doesn't get covered there will be covered by FEMA. So uh, that's all good news there. Uh, Public Works, the Father Isle Road, that's up where we lost that one lane three years ago. And then the Sandy River Road, which was a preventative uh, stabilization project, those are going to be looked up to bid. Um, the notice to public tomorrow. Uh, there is a pre-bid meeting next week. Bids will be due the 22nd, ideally before you on June 5th, so that we can uh, hit the construction period of July 15th through September 15th to get in water with that. So that is the big and pricey project. It's obviously a tool in there, but um, that should be paid for with uh, congressional directed spending. The field day, that's not the school's field day, that's our field day for getting our ball fields ready in the spring. It was a phenomenal success. Um, kids, adults, everybody there, a bunch of equipment. It came out really great. I was over there last night and things looked amazing. So uh, thank you to everybody there. Also, thank you to uh, Matt Everett and Scott Libby, who were finally able to get water into the shack. And I worked the shack last night. It was wonderful being in the water. Anyway. Yeah, I was like, I didn't trust me. I didn't. I and then, Hi, Robert, everybody. <laughs> somebody drive over. Uh, and the last thing that I have is the sewer commission is going to meet on Monday, May 13th at 4 30. That's been planned. Uh, but they're going to hear a presentation from all of our associates, who's uh, the overseeing consultant of our plan for the I, &I study, talking about the methods, stages of completing the study, as well as estimated costs. It should be pretty informative, but I'm also guiding really um, the Maintenance, ongoing maintenance and operation of the department. So we will look at um, discussion action on May 1st, general warrant number eight. Motion to approve general warrant number eight. Yeah, the amount of 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 the amount None. All those in favor? That's everybody. All right. Uh, public comment. Um, on the, the uh, crossing, Bob, have we got any further ahead on that? 
Is that going to be anywhere? Do you think we may have it on the agenda for this year, or is it going to be pushed? Uh, my guess is it's going to be pushed probably in large part because of permitting. Uh, the uh, company that was going to be creating the um, pipe that we were going to be using was supposed to get me design and plans at the end of March, and I still haven't heard from them. So, it's so we're not, still talking. So, okay, it's up to so we're probably going to end up forfeiting that grain is what it amounts to. But but we should really get it in. Was there be cost savings on the other side? Okay, so it it should be money. What over we should have? Well, we the money that you're getting from the federal government. Are we going to set some aside to help pay for that project? Or are we going to try to fund that on our own next year? No, we're going to fund that on our own. My intention is to fund that on our own next year because when you have federal dollars, the federal dollars from federal regulations. And so what I we're going to talk about as a road committee and, and staff is using that for the less restrictive projects like paving or, you know, the improvements. No, no, I'm just, so, okay, I just was. I don't, I don't want to get any of the water with federal money. Right. Okay. Yep. 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 And that's it. And if if we got a new chair for the night, let's talk to people. <laughs> no, <laughs> two, two minutes are up. Take, right. I'm just taking advantage of a situation. Do we have one? Where do you want to put this speed bump? Oh, oh, down by Lindsay. I'll tell you what, I was taking out of Upper Main Street and install it down on the River Road. That would make me happy, Lindsay happy. I would be ecstatic. I wouldn't mind if they Not that one, but I'm not. <laughs> oh, listen, it could be moved. <laughs> okay. So, uh, discussion action on roadside mowing proposals. Okay, so we put this out to bid. It was a six week window. If and we received one proposal from Nord um, Nord Stock Farm LLC. The price per mile quoted was one ninety per mile. This is both sides of the road. On that, it's eight feet, not the ten feet. Um, it also includes the request of one hundred feet on each side of the major intersections that we listed, which are usually state responsibility. And one of them is the Beach Hill Road on Burner Road, um, Airport Road, intersections like that. Uh, the price for Sunset was seven fifty twice per year. That's the back behind the flagpole of Sunset View Cemetery. Um, and then he provided you the estimate as to how he calculated the square footage and costs associated with that. The price proposed here is less than what it was last year. Last year, they were also quoting um, a 10 foot. So um, this being the one proposal. Uh, the so just give me the number to use it. Sorry, less than or just it's going to be about, I believe it was about twenty thousand dollars total. Total because it's just per mile. How many miles did we have? Roughly 50. Okay, roughly. But I don't know my local. Don't hold me to it. Okay. Last year the estimate was twenty-four thousand with the price that we had on the table. So it'll be twenty or little. So yeah, you know, right concurrent. I just have one comment to that. We did not get our money from last year. No, I agree. So we didn't get the tenant board, and he did, it was not called me for sure. The only other thing to kind of an aside to this was when Matt and I were working on the agenda last week, uh, he mentioned that he would like to see me go and explore alternatives for considering doing something like this in-house. So I've started looking at machines that could maybe double for sidewalk and roadside mold yeah. or whatnot like that. So um, that would probably come up at a later meeting next probably the next yeah. two to three meetings and have something and the road committee will have to be involved in that conversation too. It, it's long overdue, I think, for a combination, but it's going to cost, what what you're looking at is probably not going to be cheap. Yes. Right. And so then it's about funding mechanisms. Yes. Yeah. Because you need a dual, dual purpose and it needs to be that the machine you're doing sidewalks with right now, there's nothing more yeah. than one more that's trying to do. And that needs to be replaced as well. So it's a matter of trying to figure yes. out, you know, when we discussed it, it was what gives us the most bang for our buck. We don't want to buy one machine that only does this, one that does that. It makes for a bit more sense. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if it's got a four or five year complete return on investment, then, you know. It makes sense. It does make sense. So forward for this year and yeah. plan for future. Right? Yes. Yeah. Because even if we try to order something now, we wouldn't have any time to do this. So I think this gives us that bridge to really explore what our options are um, and then go forward with that. So looking for um, a motion on um, the roadside mowing proposals. I'll make a motion as proposed. 
to accept as the code from North Shop Farm. Do I have a second? That's a motion to second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? All right. Okay, so discussion action on the public works acquisition of the sewer pump truck. <laughs> Like got the inside of Berkeley. Oh, the answer is no. Where they have to go? Into Kevin. Uh, there's a fire on the side of East Pond. Okay. I, ju I just meant the answer to the truck. So. Uh, so this came, I mentioned it at the last meeting, and that was that the Public Works Department would like to have a sewer pump truck that's over the sewer plant that hasn't been used in four and a half years. Uh, so I took it to the sewer commissioner and said, well, what's your pleasure? They said, it's, it's been sitting here for four and a half years, we should liquidate. Um, Tim, the operator, did some homework, which is this hand page here in terms of information about the truck money that we've got into it. Um, and whatnot. So you can see that we spent quite a bit of money here um, in the last four to five years on this truck. So it's got almost brand new tires. It's got a lot of front end work. Uh, work was just done to get a sticker, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the sewer commission said 16,000 they would sell it to public works or it goes out to bid. And so, um, uh, yes, public works wants it, but public works has more needs, I believe, uh, in terms of equipment and vehicles. And adding another vehicle to their fleet is probably going to sit outside with it on inside space, probably not a service. And is it worth sixteen thousand dollars to have that extra vehicle? But we already have a truck that we're using to spread gas in the water. Um, the only difference is that this would allow you to pump if you were out seeing the river, you wouldn't come back into town and go back out. From my perspective, I don't think that the department would get its money's worth out of it. You can buy that gas for sixteen thousand dollars. Yes. Back and forth. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's a nineteen ninety four truck, so I know. Like, well, <laughs> so like, it's not to take away from it, it's in very good condition. And sure. we do have people that have qualified to prices that were comfortable putting a minimum on it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, my recommendation would be for folks to put this out to them um, with the minimum bid. All right. So the the public works wants it. Well, they did, but when I, I spoke with the foreman about it and, you know, the value of a vehicle, the cost of a vehicle, maintenance, and, and when you put calcium in a vehicle, it's going to rust. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what we're seeing with the current truck that we have now. Um, I just, they understand that, the, they understand the cost of the benefit, obviously, if money wasn't an issue, they would want it and they would have it, but money is an issue. And so... For what it would be used for, I don't think that it was valid. We're also looking uh, at a piece of equipment to go on the back of the red truck that would help with calcium here and there. Uh, that hopefully will be funded through an ATV grant because it'd be used for the rail shaft. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I make a motion for the 1994 International or I don't know how to say that, 4,800 4, sewer pump truck out to bed as presented. Do we have a second? All right, all those in any further discussion? All those in favor? Right. I'm that does this. Let me remember this. <laughs> all right. <laughs> okay, all right. So, all right. Discussion action on proposed agreement regarding overweight permits for DOT products. Okay, uh, this is, I would say, a formality, but the last time one of these came before us, we did not approve it. And it had to do with the timing and the location of the project. This project here is um, Route 201 Madison Road, and that's the resurfacing project. Um, and, and this agreement would allow the contractor with the state to put their overweight equipment and loads on our roads. So when I look at the roads that would be affected by it, I'm looking at Father Mile Road, which is already in fairly poor condition. Um, and if they do it this construction season, it's going to have some obstacles with our construction equipment on there. Um, and then you've got Soul Canyon Lane. And well, I get it, but I, our roads are pretty good for them to be able to do the same list. Um, and so, given the nature of the project, I don't think that it's much of an issue for us. And they also will hold bond for the town if there's a big issue. All right. So, if they break it, they don't have to come to the thing. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's right. right. Hold the bond. Yeah. All right. So, what's your recommendation on that as far as the bond? I mean, I read through it. Yes. Because there's is bond through the contractor too, 
Right. I mean, I, I this one is specifically for the town. In my past experience, you don't need to hold the ball on that. The state will come through and support it. And and they're all they're always gonna look at well, what was the original condition of the road? So we can't ask a contractor to come back and fix Father Alvaro for us. It's right, you know, so for me, lane may be another issue, but a lot of districts have been doing a pretty good job of taking that road up lately. So I, I think that just yeah, so relying on the state is do it. yeah. And do we do our due diligence as far as just going up and getting photographs of the road as is prior to or something like that, just so that we can show if this is what it was when we stopped yeah. the road, even with the OT saying yeah. no, that hey, that's there. Now, yeah. they can't come yeah. back and say, well, that. I was already like that prior to Tuesday. We want to take pictures of Korea for the wall. We wanted to. All right. So I guess that what I'm looking for is a motion to sign a proposed agreement with the DOT project number 026069, authorizing the contractor to use overweight equipment and loads on municipal waste for the purpose of completing the project. So And a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? That's everybody. All right. Next item on the docket is discussion action on the real estate agent request for proposal insurance. Thank you. All right. So this stems from tax buyer property acquisition for sewer use charge, non payment sewer use charges. And we're going to have to use a broker. And so we've got some that live here in town, we've got based here in town, yeah, yeah. Uh, candidly, the cost really doesn't matter uh, because that's gonna get built to the property. But ideally, you know, if there is some flexibility there, it favors everybody because if we were moving on a real estate transaction or whatnot, I would think that we would probably wanna use one that we had a good relationship with on it. So I think that there's some, uh, Consideration given the price there, but um, this is something I took four or five different ones from around the state. Most of them are just regular operational, but um, I did have one that was more focused on the disposal of foreclosed properties. Um, and pretty much the area that I like in on is the minimum qualifications of the proposers, um, in good standing, knowledgeable about the local market, knowledgeable about public real estate records. And a, a good reputation, and then that really translates into uh, the evaluation criteria, uh, which then includes fee schedule and level of responsiveness. So, um, I drafted this just to be open for a month. It would close on maybe the thirtieth, um, and then we would be able to look at it in June if any second. And we could do the second meeting in June so that we were ready to hit the deadline and apply these properties came up. So I don't know if you had a chance to review it, any changes or suggestions, but it's what I draft it up. Yeah, so I guess to open up discussion, can we get a motion to um, issue the real estate brokerage service request for proposals as presented? Mm -hmm. Siri, you know us again. All right, so we have motion and a second. Uh, any further discussion? Um, yes. I think my only would be once this comes in, I think that where it's not like a big with everything else, it's going to be tough because usually we just pick the lowest, you know, one if we have like three local real estate agents and they all provide the same services. I think that then we're going to be in a little bit of a, that would be my worry. How do we pick if they're all doing the same thing, all have experience? We don't want to have any sort of impropriety there saying like, I like that one. I don't like, I mean, that would be my only concern as a board is how we decide who to go with um, that's the only thing I feel like we're leaving our problem open for for you know any sort of liability to you know with transparency and just staying completely objective and not letting any subjectivity come into play. Right. Would, I think part of that would be the resume that they submit. Exactly. The proposal, yeah. yeah. That, that whatever they document yeah. there is kind of the yeah. judge yeah. that a small factor of price is going to be responsiveness. Yeah. You don't want to be overwhelmed with materials because if they're going to overwhelm your proposal, they're going to overwhelm you everywhere else. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And right. if they've got municipal references and things like that. I think yeah. those will play. So we'll just kind of play it by ear, I guess, and say, people, this is new to us. I just, you know, putting that out there so we're all sort of done. So, mm -hmm. okay, so we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? That's everybody. All right, so the next item here is discussion action on appointments. 
Now, there is a vacancy on the Board of Appeals, which was opened by the resignation of Todd Pinio. Todd's term was to expire April 2026. We received a full application from James Lyman to fulfill that term. So I'm looking for a motion on to appoint James Lyman to the Board of Appeals for a term ending April of 2026. Do I have a motion for that? So moved. A motion. We have a second. We have a second. Any further discussion? Just a note on the form. I don't know if this form is on our website, but there's a typo under availability. It says week and mornings twice. And I think the second one should say weekend afternoons. That's all. Yeah. All right. So any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's everyone. Okay. Other business. Uh, looking for a motion to add discussion action on Maine Municipal Association Legislative Policy Committee nomination to the agenda. Do we have a motion? All right. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Uh, motion to second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, we add <laughs> <laughs> So the Legislative Policy Committee is the LPC. What it is, it's the lobbying arm of the Municipal Association. So every Senate district has two representatives. So we're in Senate 3 still, I think. And so it's been me and I believe Elaine Owls from Solon's been on. Um, it sets the priorities for how they're going to go to Augusta and advocate for us, whether that's um, unfunded mandates, it's the rash of junk that we had here in Brown for the last session, all the regulations, unfunded, and whatnot, administrative burdens. Um, but it gives us a, a seat on the table. The larger of this is, I don't know if it was that, but I can go to my office. Um, and I think that it's been beneficial. One of my big things is that, you know, we're taxing for the welfare general assistance in Portland and South Portland and whatnot, when really their votes don't outweigh ours, and yet that becomes a priority of the association. So things like that allow by me allocating my time there when I came here eight plus years ago, that was a complaint. You know, just not here enough. So I'm here, but when I this is three or four hours a month when they're in session. But I think it's a return for us in terms of being able to help the association pick what they're going to put about best. Okay. So what are we looking for for a motion just to motion to nominate me uh, to the committee? Do you have a motion? So we have a second. Second. All right. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's everyone. All right. So motion to nominate Richard LaBelle to the Main Municipal Association Legislative Policy Committee and to authorize Mr. Everett to sign for the board on the board's behalf. Let me just sit down. Now. It is. Oh, okay. Uh, now. To authorize me on the behalf of the board's behalf. I'm talking about the <laughs> me, Lindsay Lynch, on the behalf. <laughs> Looking for a motion. Yes. So Cool. Let's do a second. Okay. All right. Motion to second. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? That's everybody. I'm going to ask the vice chair if she's willing to give up the floor and call for a vote among other members for somebody to fill your seat for the purpose of this next topic. So moved. No, no, no. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> This is a very informal process because I can't let vice chair. I'll entertain a motion for a vice vice chair. Somebody to fill in. I nominate this. Ronnie as vice vice chair. <laughs> Did you do that? So you was not Any further discussion about nominating Ronnie as our sit in chair? I just can we get that added to the, the bar? Yeah, vice vice chair. Somebody's in favor of vice vice chairing. We just vote it. That's everyone. Those opposed. Those abstained. Okay, thank I you. Can I can't see that. <laughs> so. Now, she can do the next. Yes, No, you, you can match the problem with the screen on that. Oh, okay, I'm over here. Yes, <laughs> thank okay. you. You bring your chair with you. Oh, hey guys. Yeah, sure right. fellas. No problem. So, you need a motion on the next one? To yeah. add. Yes. Uh, motion to add discussion action on land lease for agricultural purposes to the agenda. So moved. And I'll second. Yep. Yeah. Any further discussion? No. All those in favor? Thank you. So we have received a request from John Lynch for the purposes of transparency. That is the wife of Lynch, uh, husband of Lindsay Lynch, owner of Lynch Landscapers. 
uh, and would has requested to lease the town field abutting the wastewater treatment plant on Willow Street. We have had that as a standing article in our town meeting, Warren, as long as I've been here. The Frolos used to uh, farm that land. They would go in and seed it down and cut it and whatnot. Um, and for the last probably four or five years, it's just gone unattended. Um, John reached out to me a while ago and said, hey, would you have any interest in us being able to use this uh, for pasturing and for hay? And I said he needed to submit something to you. So he has since submitted uh, the request to you. He's also submitted uh, a certificate of liability, which is a commitment of that. Um, and he would write the town or drop a check for one dollar um, to execute that lease agreement. Do you have any questions about that kind of arrangement, best practice, or anything? Probably, but we don't have this. You just have it. Do you, it's, it's, sorry, I just have Okay. Has anybody been maintaining it at all for the last four or five years? No. So if you don't do something with it, yeah, it's got to get pushed up. Yeah, you know, yeah. And there's just no liabilities in the town. No, but the, the agreement that we had used before um, puts all liability on them, holds us harmless, and then we hold the certificate um, of their insurance. The benefit to Lynch Landscaping doing it is that they have commercial insurance that we cover if there was ever an issue. But I mean, our facility is fast. Is it a year to year thing? Or yes. Okay. One year. Can they build anything? No. No. Okay. I don't know. It, it's literally going to get hate twice. Not supposed to. I am public use all the time. <laughs> 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 yeah, but you know, okay, this motion to authorize the town manager to sign a lease agreement with Lynch Landscaping to allow for pasture horses and hanging at the wastewater treatment <laughs> facility. So, any further discussion? Um, it's fine that it's part of the wastewater treatment facility. That's the only place that's ever done us. Anything else? All those in favor? Thank you. Do we have a motion for me to come back in the chair? Okay. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Can we have all the votes? No. <laughs> oh, hey. Yeah, yeah. She's, good. She's welcome back here in the audience. <laughs> all right. So. Did we discuss the fact that I pay for that? Okay, move. <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokie. So, motion to add discussion action on release of town owned property to the agenda. So, moved. Do I have a second? Motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? That's everybody. Uh, this item is related to 11 Everett Street, uh, which was foreclosed on for non payment of sewer use charges back in December. Uh, reached out to by a stakeholder who paid all of the balance. Um, so I tabulated that and they ended up with a small overpayment on their on their account. Um, and the condition is that it gets dated back to the person from whom it was taken. So there's really no issue here. Um, it's just gonna clear this one more property up for books that we wanted to send to realtor. The where, town has been made whole. Where is this property? 11 Everett. Yeah, but like where is that? That's up uh, beyond Dunkin' Donuts on the right. Is that on the corner? No. Is it that one? No, it's not. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> That's all. Is he still alive? We're not here to talk about members of the public that I press. So we're looking for a motion to sign a quick claim deed releasing the town's interest on property located at 11 Everett Street, map is 35, lot 43, to Jamie K. Bicka, the party from which probably was taken, put a payment of all back taxes, sewer use charges, fees, and recharges, and allowable expenses. Looking for a so second. Second. Motion to second. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? That's everybody. All right, so motion to discussion action on MSAD 54 warrant and notice of election calling Main School Administrative District number 54 budget validation referendum to the agenda. So second. Second. So motion to second. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? This is rather a formality. Uh, to sign off on, we have to count the sign warrant that they have calling the school budget hearing. Um, this doesn't support the budget or anything else, just it's a formality that folks do. So we're looking for a motion to counter sign the MSC 54 warrant and notice of election calling made school minister number 54 budget validation referendum. So moved. Second. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? 
That's everybody. Three sets. All right, so we're looking for a motion to go into executive session pursuant the one MRSA 405 to discuss potential real estate acquisition. So moved. No, second. That's a motion and a second. Motion. Okay. Discussion. Discussion, huh? Is there any discussion? Is there any discussion on it? Don't we do that in executive All session? Favor, All those in favor of going into executive session. That's everybody. <laughs> and the board is not making a decision tonight. So for the interest of data and recording, we're going to shut the recording off right now. Thanks for coming.